Okay, uh, I am ecstatic to have Dr. George Rubri with me. Uh, the, he's the guy that wrote that famous little video, uh, What the Phonics Is. <laughs> okay, and uh, th that whole nine yards. Uh, he, I, I was just talking to him in, in advance of this and saying, yeah, well, if I did his introduction, we, we'd have to have like an hour long thing. Uh, he, he has so many credentials and the rest. So what I think I will do is just turn things over to you and ask you to tell us a little bit about your background and then we'll jump into some of the questions or some of the things we want to cover. So tell us a little bit about you and your background and uh, credentials, which are many. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> uh, I'll just try to keep it, keep it short. Uh, uh, I can well, I came to uh, education as a, as a very young boy, right? As most of us who are boys do. Uh, and, uh, but I, I didn't become, I didn't get into teaching uh, until I was in uh, my 30s, and uh, and then didn't, and did it as a substitute teacher, who then became a full time emergency hire, and then went and got my credentials uh, and taught high school, and um, and then I uh, got kind of well, I got into the doctoral program at the University of Georgia and got my uh, doc doctorate in reading education. Uh, Donna Alverman was my major professor, and I got to work with great people there, like uh, David Reinking and uh, Stephen Stahl, Jim Bauman, Linda Labo, Yuri Bauer. Uh, yeah, I could just go on. And and um, but while I was there, uh, I spent uh, a lot of time outside of the College of Ed studying neuroscience. Now this was back in the the 1990s, and um, it was just getting going and people were all very excited about it. And there was something called brain-based education developing. And, but at the same time in, in some conservative media portals, like the wall street journal or places like that, there was uh, mounting commentary that seemed to push the narrative that people are inherently what they are and you can't change them. Now that has some profound negative implications <laughs> for education. If you think somebody can't change, what's the point of throwing good money after bad, right? Especially if you say that the change, that, that the, the capacities are intergenerational due to genetics. And the funny thing is now, and it's not really funny, it's sad, uh, we know so much more uh, about the, the genetics and neuroendocrinology uh, of human beings and how they it does in fact change over time. Um, and... So, so we've got, got a scientific basis for suspecting that those, those very old ideas that go back to the Bronze Age uh, are probably not good guidance for education policy. Um, the idea that kids who are poor can't be helped, that they are disabled and therefore incapable of learning is just wrong. Um, very few kids have specific uh, uh, learning disabilities with a, a, a focus on reading or, uh, you know, in other words, dyslexic in the clinical sense. Some, uh, perhaps, but very rare. Most kids simply have not had the educational affordances they need to become good readers. And there are lots of reasons for that. And it's not about, I, I don't want to suggest we should waste our time getting into a blame game. Uh, but we we should turn to the research and, and get some guidance on what to do about it. Okay. Well, that's a, a perfect segue into the first topic. Of wait, wait, I should oh, say one I'm other not... thing. I'm sorry, Sam. Okay, no, go for it. <laughs> I, I'm an associate research title professor at literacy education at the University of Kentucky. If I didn't put that in, they'd be mad at me. Oh, boy. Uh, that's <laughs> incredibly impressive. Uh, uh, when you look at a research piece, uh, you really... Uh, look at it. Uh, you really know your stuff. All right. Now let's get into that business of neuroscience. Uh, I got to see you uh, at uh, LitCon and, and your presentation there, and you wowed that audience. You wowed me. Okay. I, I promise you with, with some of the things you had to say about brain research, some of them that I just never heard of before about, the, you know, things like the brain lighting up or the uh, two, two spots lighting up or the um, no real glitches. Uh, I'm kind of giving you a little leads there on possibilities of things to talk about. But uh, boy, your presentation on uh, brain research really 
doesn't fit what I see out there on social media from some of the science of reading people. So could you just give us a, a, a little bit about uh, what's the brain research about um, and uh, what are its limitations? Okay, well, like any research, uh, neuroscience does have its limitations, methodological limitations, theoretical limitations. Same is true for educational research of all sorts, quantitative or qualitative. Uh, uh, keep in mind that when we do research, what we're doing research on, we, we, we glean empirical um, evidence uh, of some sort about natural phenomena that we, we want to understand. And that 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 data, whether it's quantitative or or, or linguistic, you know, description, uh, or, or or whatever, is symbolic. It's a symbolic representation, and we are the symbol-using species. But the symbolic representation of a phenomenon is not the phenomenon. Right? You do not want to confuse the map with the territory. The representation is always, always far more simplistic than the thing itself that we're trying to understand. So, um, so that's that's one of the major limitations, and you'll see that because what I want to share with you are some images, brain images, and those are, you know, people see those images and they think, oh my gosh, look, a photograph of the brain in action. It's lighting up and all that, right? But you know, I'm, can, can I share my screen? To, oh, absolutely. To yeah. Work. Oh, it does. Oh, look at all that. Oh my. <laughs> All right. So this is an image of the brain. And I hope you realize that this is not a real brain. Okay. Uh, and it's lighting up. Look at that. <laughs> All right. Um, now, this is another image of the brain. This is actually a, 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 a neuroscientific uh, image of a slice of the brain. You're looking at the left side of the brain, and it's a, a, a lateral uh, slice. So, in, in other words, it's like a slice this way, a few, about a, an inch or two in, in inwards, all right? And uh, what do you see there? You see those two dots, the, the blue and the red. And what those are are um, areas that have uh, been found to be active when kids or adults decode texts, when they read but uh we're we're talking here about reading right now uh, uh emphasizing the decoding part of you know the simple view of reading right, right. reading oh, is the absolutely. product of decoding and language comprehension well right now we're looking at decoding we'll look at language comprehension in a moment and there are two pathways that run uh from our visual processing area which is the area to the right that's the occipital lobe that's where those arrows are starting uh, and one pathway, the upper pathway, the blue one, uh, is called the dorsal pathway, that runs up through the temporal parietal region, that blue blob that you see there, which is where, uh, it's Wernicke's area, it's where sound processing and lang language sound processing occurs. And so th that area uh, shows a lot of activity, and I'll explain what this, this quote-unquote lighting up actually is. It's not a photograph of the brain in action. It's a statistical chart. Uh, I'll explain that in a moment. But the um, uh, that area tends to show activity uh, when children are sounding out letters, uh, as one would teach them to do with their phonics, for instance. Okay, the lower pathway, the ventral pathway, the red arrow, is running through a, a slightly smaller red blob down there. That's the what some call the visual word processing area. It's the uh, uh, temporal occipital um, uh, sulcus uh, down there, inferior temporal uh, uh, occipital. And uh, that is where sight words are getting processed. Now, what is interesting, about, and, they, and both of these arrows wind up converging in the medial temporal uh, uh, area, uh, medial temporal lobe, left side of the brain. Uh, this is an area where we see activity when you understand the meaning of a word. Um, here's another image of the left side of the brain. Now we're looking at the outside of the, of the cerebral cortex, mostly, although you can see the cerebellum in the lower right. Um, the red areas are the areas that tend to show activation when someone is listening to language. The green areas show uh, other areas that are active when you read 
and the white shows uh, an overlap. And here we're including some language comprehension areas, the, uh, the areas uh, to the left half of uh, that image of the brain. Um, but again, you can see the uh, kind of the two pathways right there, the dorsal and the ventral, the uh, supermarginal pathway for sounding words out letter by letter, and the uh, ventral pathway for sight word uh, recognition, which uh, turns out these two pathways have nothing, do not connect to one another until they converge in that medial uh, temporal area for word meaning. Uh, and we know this because we've been able to trace now the, the tracts, the neural tracts that combine these. So that's interesting that we can have sight word reading that does not involve sounding out, because you always hear from the phonics uh, advocates and the science of reading people particularly, that, that uh, competent readers are always sounding out every red letter and every word that they read, even though they don't know they're doing it because they're doing it so quickly. Uh, but this anatomical, uh, research would suggest otherwise. Um, here's another uh, I, I'm, map. I'm going to stop you right there and just yeah. ask you to repeat that, because I really want to emphasize that to my audience, that uh, uh, that I've heard it so many times in so many places that, oh, you're always sounding out. Uh, and uh, what you're saying is the brain research just doesn't support that notion. That they're, they're Right. When, when you can talk about it, sight word uh, and using sight words uh, was pretty well right on target. Yeah, yeah. When, when, when you, uh, if you know, neuroscience studies have been done, there are quite a number of them now that compare uh, better readers, uh, younger readers to struggling younger readers, uh, uh, struggling decoders, I should say, with better decoders. And uh, you find that the better decoders use that ventral pathway. If you compare adult competent readers with children, you see that they rely very heavily on that ventral pathway, not the sounding out pathway. And so what that, and because it doesn't involve the areas of the brain that are active when you are generating language sounds or when you're comprehending language sounds, that, that suggests that uh, sound processing isn't part of the equation. What is being processed in that visual word form area is uh, letter sequence patterns. And the interesting thing about the uh, occipital temporal uh, area is that it's the same area that we use when we recognize familiar objects or when we recognize familiar faces, okay? So it's about pattern recognition. Uh, it's not about the shape of the word. Um, it's just the fact, it's more of a Bayesian analysis, right? Some letters appear more commonly than others. Some precede some letters more commonly. Some follow some letters more commonly. Certain sequences are more common. And so as we become acclimated to that, thanks to good phonics that helps us, you know, we, we learn to sound out every letter in every word. And in the process, without realizing it, what we're doing is learning the probabilities of certain letter sequences. Your text messaging app does the exact same thing. When you start typing out a message, a couple letters of the first word, it guesses what the word is. It's not guessing. It knows that there are certain words that are more probable than others. And sometimes it's wrong, but more often than not, it's right. And then after it gets that first word, it does the same thing to suggest three possible next words. If you start it off with a, with a, a noun that's a subject, the very first word of a sentence, it's going to suggest a verb. You know, to go check and try. Uh, it might not be the verb you intend, but it'll be a verb because that is a grammatical uh, sequence. That uh, and and so and this has been noted by neuroscientists that uh, not just about reading and language, but many other things as well. The brain is a pattern recognizer. That's what it does. And so, in in learning to sound out our uh, alphabetically represented language forms, what we're doing is at the same time uh, inadvertently, but thankfully learning uh, the probabilities of letter sequences. And this is what Usha Goswami's work on brain size analysis of, uh, uh, of looking for brain activity. If you just insist on looking for phonemes getting processed, you're going to have uh, a tough time. So this image here is, is showing um, the areas of the brain, again, the left side, again, the purple areas are the areas for sound processing. The orange areas are 
the uh, the letter sequence processing and the green areas are for meaning. And you'll notice here again that both the uh, uh, the inferior uh, occipital temporal area, the orange area, has its arrow going into the medial temporal gyrus, and the a speech segmentation area, the the uh, superior temporal, has its arrow as well, and they all converge there at meaning. Um, now, once they do, they will also then activate the other pathway as sort of a recheck. But um, that's what here's the here's the medial temporal area for word meaning. So it's actually extends across the the, the temporal lobe. That's that lower uh, set of blobs there. So uh, here's uh, here's how we know that those two pathways don't relate. This is white matter tract. White matter tracts in the brain are are neural bundles that are, are get used so much that they grow, they get large, they develop a white fatty sheath to help make them more efficient uh, in terms of their use of glucose and oxygen. These are living cells. These aren't wires. They have to uh, have that. And uh, and so we can use uh, tensor imaging and, and other other technological forms to image these white matter tracts. And you can see here uh, that these different pathways, the superior longitudinal, the arculate fasciculus, the inferior longitudinal uh, fasciculus are quite distinct and they don't connect except in particular places. And so we can rule out that there is some sort of coordination between those two areas simultaneously, well, they're simultaneously active if they are. Um, but as I say, there's always brought back propagation. Keep in mind, neural processes are occurring at, at the level of milliseconds, all right? And it takes 650 milliseconds, two thirds of a second for you to be aware of something like a pinprick. So these things are going on so quickly, you can't possibly intuit through self-reflection, what's going on at this level. And, and that's what uh, people are saying when they say that you decode all the time. That's because their cognitive models of mental process would do that. But there's neuroscientists are rather ambivalent about the existence of there being non-conscious mental processes. There's conscious thoughts uh, and there are biological processes, but the idea that there's some psyche in between that's doing computer programming is uh, just not li likely, but you see it in the media all the time. Here again, the two pathways. Uh, and here's uh, myself and uh, Ian Mitra, a, uh, he's now at a Boston Medical, I believe. Uh, and we, we did a review for the uh, International Encyclopedia of Education that just came out on the uh, neuroscience of reading. And you see the blue arrows, again, the left side of the brain, Blue arrows are your decoding processes. Red solid arrows are your word uh, comprehension processes. The dotted red arrows are your uh, larger uh, semantic processes, understanding paragraphs and texts and storylines and so on. And all of this is about pattern recognition. And those green arrows uh, are, so this is something new that's begun to be discovered, that the areas in the superior parietal cortex help facilitate pattern recognition elsewhere in the brain. And so what's going on in the visual word form area relies upon uh, what's going on up there at the top as well. And here's a little video. Can I play it? Oh, uh, let's see. Okay. Again, left side of the brain. And uh, this is based on uh, EEG and MEG. Uh, I won't get into the technicalities of that. All right. So the left side of the brain, and you can see that visual, auditory, tactile. So those are your sensory processing areas. Again, blue areas for decoding, your letter sounding, your auditory word form area, your visual word form area, which is to say sight words. And then comprehension in red, word meaning and syntax. I don't want to, to clutter it with too many other things. And then those little asterisks there show you where emotions are processed. And here is someone, and I'll tell you up in, in advance that this is an adult uh, in one of these, uh, it, doing these studies. It's it's based on a whole lot of studies, actually, a meta-analysis. Oh, it's not playing your media, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do it in just a second. Uh, and in fact, it is one second of reading, okay? 
So one second of reading in the ba in the brain, with apologies to Phil Goff's one second of reading, that was metal processes. This is actual processes. You ready? Here we go. Okay. Oh, that was pretty fast. That's one second. All right. Let me slow it down so it takes 10 seconds. All right. If you look down at the bottom left in blue, you can see there's a counter for milliseconds. So this is how fast things are, are happening. Uh, but this this is, uh, again, you'll see the processing start with a visual, obviously. You've got to look at the, at the page or the screen. And then it's going to move forward through decoding towards comprehension. See that? Now, uh, again, you don't see a lot going on in letter sounding, but these are this is an adult reader, and they're reading a word. Um, and then, of course, if you want to talk about listening, what's the difference? Well, there's, there's no visual processing necessary. There's no decoding skills necessary. So what do you get? You get this. Activation in the areas for meaning making from from sound processing. Now, um, if you notice, that took longer to process than reading a word, and that's why we teach reading. It's a lot more efficient, a lot quicker. Um, okay, what do I share? I could share some other studies with you. This is that that, that area uh, at the top of the brain for processing. What's interesting is that in this research, this is uh, a Meisler and Gabrielli, uh, 2022, in a neuro image and what they were looking at they were looking at children from age five to age 17 i believe and uh, they were looking at their white matter densities and their reading abilities and they found no significant differences between better readers and less good readers uh under what, nine years of age and they found no differences between uh average readers and dyslexic readers in that group. They did, however, find uh, a correlation between um, uh, white matter density and non-word reading, in other words, sounding out without rec a word recognition being involved with, um, with readers who are older than age nine. And because there is no evidence of a neural difference prior to that age in reading, the researchers came to the conclusion that this was due to learning differences between the, 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 the kids, and that, in other words, some kids had better reading instruction than others. Here's a, another study. This is Frederenko and Blank, 2020, Trends in Cognitive Science. And they're looking and comparing two things. On the left-hand side, they're looking at reading, and they're comparing uh, reading of sentences with reading of non-words. On the right-hand side, they're, com they're comparing spatial reasoning. So no language, no reading, just hard versus easy spatial working memory tasks. And the, the color coding has to do with the number of participants because there's so much variance uh, between individuals in these studies. And what it shows uh, that, that 44 and 45 areas, that's Brokaw's area for language generation and comprehension. And that shows that both working memory and reading, in other words, symbolic reasoning and language comp processing occur in those areas. They have slightly different dedications neurally, but they are, um, you know, this is looking at individuals and you can see how different it is from individual to individual. When you look at these charts, it's an average of hundreds and hundreds of measures done for each individual participant in the study, each subject in the study. And then it might only be 20 subjects, right? And then you uh, do the same thing for a comparative condition. So you might have them read words, and then you might have them recognize objects. You average those hundreds of measures for each of those two conditions. You subtract the two, and the areas that are quote unquote lit up are not the brain reading. That's the difference between the brain reading and the brain looking at objects, you see? So it's a statistical chart. It's not a photograph. So that's let me. So uh, let me get. I, I'm going to ask you to dwell on that for just a second. Sure. Uh, that uh, really 
the the charts that we see where we have a brain lit up and all the rest are are not really actual images of the brain. They are actually predictions of a, a series. Well, I don't want to misspeak it, but basically it's a statistical graph, uh, and therefore it's not a direct picture, and uh, that has led uh, to some problems, I think, in, in terms of. Uh, how uh, sure you can be uh, of some some of the brain research. I'm remembering you tell, talking about that point that right. it, All, it's not always uh, reliable. Right, right. Because science deals with probabilities, not certainties. If you want that, you, you know, you either go to a house of worship or or find yourself a guru. But if 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 you're doing science, you're talking probabilities. Um, and, uh, so, so the, the problem we have in, in a lot of issues in neuroscience and neuroscientists are the first to admit them, most of them. Uh, but it's the, it's the cognitive reading researchers who borrow this stuff and don't either fully understand it or, or aren't being fully forthcoming, um, who misinterpret it often on behalf of what do you know, proving their theory, but it's not about their theory. It's not even about reading this research. It's about how the brain works. And they're just using cognitive uh, categories as a matter of convenience because they have to start somewhere. And you know, but it, but nobody's theory of reading is proven by neuroscience. So when you hear people like in the science of reading who say we now know that certain approaches are definitively, and none of this research has anything to do with what works in the classroom, right? It's about what's going on in your brain, <laughs> and it's going on at the matter of milliseconds. And it's going on at microscopic areas, you know, level, everything from genetics to uh, proteomics to biochemical reactions at the synapses to cellular processes and growth and, and, and reproduction of neural nerve cells and, and, and the co-regulation of the nervous and the endocrine systems that allow us to, as like any uh, neurologically endowed multicellular organism, negotiate our environments whether they be physical, biological, uh, socio-emotional, cultural, societal, or symbolic, as in reading texts. So, I'm going to make a little command decision here. Uh, I'm watching the clock, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm thinking that this would be a perfect place to break and call what you've said so far part one. <laughs> okay, that really does can include part one. We'll pick up next week with part two. Uh, I hope you'll look at the blog itself uh, and you'll find out many good takeaways around the whole issue of what brain research is really saying. Um, hope to see you next week and thank you very much.